Happy afternoon, everybody. Welcome. I'm Master Sergeant Sam Woodhead, and on behalf of our leader and commander, Colonel Bruce R. Pulver, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the third day of the American Trombone Workshop. Um, just a couple quick announcements. Um, if you haven't already done so, uh, please take advantage of you to help us track who's coming. It's a great tool for us to help justify doing a workshop like this. So if you haven't already registered, you obviously don't need it to be here, uh, but it does us a lot of good. Um, and again, justifying putting on a, a workshop like this year after year. Um, also, um, later tonight, make sure that you come back for the orchestra concert. I'm very excited about that program. Um, and the reception that is in the program uh, is unfortunately not going to happen. The USO was very excited about being able to provide a reception for us on Saturday after the final concert, but unfortunately events have uh, made the space that they were planning to use unavailable. So we will have an informal get together after the concert and we'll make sure everybody knows where that's gonna be. So if you're, don't worry, fun will be had after the concert. Um, so one thing that about the trombone workshop that we really try to do is to highlight um, all the different ways that the trombone can be used. And one of the most important and seldom represented is the brass quintet. We have a lot of trombone choirs, we have a lot of you know, large groups of trombones, but not a lot of chamber settings that use the trombone. And the brass quintet is one that we should all be extremely familiar with. And we're very excited about this group that's up on stage, um, not only because they could fit us into their schedule, um, but because we're gonna be premiering a world premiere orchestration of a piece by Anthony DiLorenzo tomorrow night on the concert band concert. Um, and we're also recording that, so look for that project in the future as well. So, uh, without further ado, Serif Brass. Hi everyone, we're so happy to be here, and sorry that we're not playing right now, but as Sam said, please catch us tomorrow night. Uh, we just recorded a little bit this morning, and so we're excited to also be recording with the band as well. Uh, my name is Mary Elizabeth Bowden, and I am the founder of Serif and Trumpeter, and we are in our ninth touring season, and you're wondering, you must be wondering, how does a group like this start? And this is a dream that I had for a long time. I found an old notebook from 2006 when I was in, a, in graduate school that said I want to form a brass quintet that's all women. And I don't even remember writing that down. But years later in 2014, I finally felt ready to start this group. Uh, I started thinking of my career in a different way. Before that, I was primarily an orchestral musician, member of the Richmond Symphony. And I wanted more variety in my life. And I really like being my own boss as well. And that's how Seraph started back in summer of 2014. And I just had a list of dreams and goals and I still keep those lists with me all the time of goals that I have for the group and for my own career as well. And Serif has been such a passion project for me and it's been such a joy to work with so many amazing women throughout the years. You, we've had uh, a bit of different personnel throughout the years and uh, the Rachels have been in the group since 2016 and Vicki and Christina are our newest members, Christina for a year and Vicki for almost two years now. And we've just had such a great time touring and being together. And on average now, we usually do about 60 to 70 concerts per tour season all around the world. The summer will be our third time in the going to Finland uh, at the Lieksa Brass Week. And I remember when I first started the group, um, with the original group, I was writing down dreams, five-year plan. And I remember I wrote down, in year five, I will write to trumpet soloist Yoko Haryana and ask him if Serif Brass can come to Lieksa Brass Week. And, but I'm not gonna write him until five years because I want us to be an established group already. And in our second year, in 2016, he sent me an email on Facebook and asked us to come that summer. So I was like, whoa, that happened much earlier, earlier than I had expected. But it just showed me that when you dream big, it can feel silly, but 
it helps put those things in motion because you're uh, putting out into the world what you hope for. And I think as a group, we're always thinking about like with our programming choices and our educational classes, uh, we're always just thinking about what we can share with the world and highlighting women composers, underrepresented composers. And this announcement will happen this month, but we have signed with Yamaha. And Yamaha has been very supportive of our master classes and touring and uh, throughout all ages from teaching kindergarten through any age with music education. So, um, you know, we've, there's a lot that goes on in the brass quintet besides just performing and rehearsing. rehearsing. I'll let Rachel cover that in a few minutes. Um, but there's also an admin side. And so each of us contributes to the group with administrative tasks. And there's a lot of inner workings that happen to make a group like this function. It's not just about making great music, but it's coordinating tours, programming, doing the financial books. I do that and I hate it. But things that have to be done to make sure that a group is running smoothly. And we still have so many more big dreams and goals that we hope to keep reaching. And uh, we recently, recently revamped our website, serifbrass.com. And I also find that reaching audiences on social media has been really, really important, not only for me as a soloist, but for Serif Brass too, because we can connect with fans. On Instagram, I think we have 16,000 followers and 25,000 on Facebook. And so we get to keep in touch with our fans uh, all around the world and also share our music. And I think that's how we've been able to really make an impact on this world with the Brass Quintet. So now I'm gonna let Rachel take over and talk about our commissions and some exciting projects that we have coming up. Thank you. Well, hello, my name is Rachel Semayoa, <clears throat> and I'm Associate Professor of Trumpet at the University of North Texas, in addition to being trumpeter with Serif Brass. This is my seventh year now with Serif Brass, and it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, one of the things I like about Serif Brass is our mission, which is to promote uh, female musicians as well as underrepresented composers. And we don't just talk the talk, we also walk the walk. With that, we um, have been part of a lot of commissions by underrepresented composers, and I wanted to tell you a few of these composers. Catherine McMichael, Renee Orth, Rena Esmail, Kevin Day, Misha Zupko, and Lillian Lee, uh, Lillian Yi, apologies. Uh, we also have a new commission coming up by Jennifer Jolly called Dust, and we'll premiere it uh, next month at, with the Texas Tech uh, University Band. Uh, we, a future uh, commission that I'm excited about is with Kev, um, not, I'm sorry, with Jeff Scott. Uh, we hope to get a commission with him. He's an exciting uh, new composer. Uh, so I think this is very important to work. You know, representation does matter. I've gotten a lot of people that speak to me about, uh, about this, that they're appreciative, that we're bringing new works uh, into the brass quintet canon, um, that, uh, that they, you know, it's, it is possible. So uh, I think it's a very important aspect of, of being part of Serif Brass. You know, we really value a high performance and excellence in what we do, but also, you know, as I said, are promoting diversity and equity in the arts. So I'm going to pass it to my colleague, Rachel, who will talk about how we, how we practice all of these new pieces. <laughs> Hello, everyone. My name is Rachel Valvicus. I play the French horn. And uh, I live in Waukegan, Illinois. And I just moved from Richmond, Virginia not too long ago. I lived there for 12 years, where I taught at the university there. And um, now I'm kind of freelancing and doing a bunch of stuff in the Midwest area. So it's fun. Um, so I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we prepare before a tour. I get that question a lot after shows. Um, aside from the, what are you doing with your hand in the bell thing? <laughs> <laughs> What's going on with that? <laughs> um, but yeah, how we prepare for shows is we will um, get the music months in advance. Um, but we all collaborate and pick pieces and programs that we all agree upon and we all uh, contribute to. And uh, once we do that, we will send out the pieces. Um, we have a giant Dropbox <laughs> folder full of music. Um, not only that, we have a lot of videos. Um, we record ourselves in every single concert, every single one, um, video included, and we listen to them um, on the regular. 
And uh, based off of those, um, if we have subs that come in, um, they're always expected to know the music before each tour. Uh, so we give them all the videos, all the music months in advance. Um, but we all have to do a lot of score study uh, so that when we do finally get together for that first rehearsal, uh, we are all, always prepared. And we only have um, one to two rehearsals tops before a tour starts, and it's always the day before. Um, so it's, it's just a lot of playing in a, in a very short amount of time, um, and so we, you better be ready for that. <laughs> and um, I think we've done a pretty good job in doing that, so. <laughs> What's that? Oh yeah, and we always get together once every uh, summer, usually. And it's about uh, six to 10 days every summer we get together and we, we call it the Seraph Retreat where we kind of retreat and just do our own thing and maybe uh, tweak the program a little bit and pick some new pieces and really, really dig into that music. But that only happens once a year for about six to 10 days. So that's it. So you better know your stuff before, before a first rehearsal. <laughs> so I will pass the ball. Hello, everyone. My name is Victoria Garcia, or Vicky. Um, I am the trombonist with Seraph Brass, so I'm with my own kind. <laughs> so I mean, like, this is why you guys are really here, right? You guys want to know more, more about me. I'm um, joking. So um, how many of us have run into the situation where like, oh, well, if I wanted to be an orchestral player, if I wanted to play in the military, um, I shouldn't do any other field of stuff, like join a brass quintet. I used to think that way. She used to think that way. So I'm gonna talk about how brass quintet playing actually enhanced my all levels of aspects of music and, and every, my private practicing, my orchestral playing. Um, so I live in Boston. And uh, when I'm not touring with Seraph, I'm an aggressive freelancer. So I do a lot of playing. I get, I'm the first call sub with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. I do a lot of playing in the Boston Pops. Um, actually, after this month-long tour, I get back the next morning. I go into BSO for two weeks. So, and then that, right after that, I go back on tour with Seraph. So I'm, whenever I'm home, I'm walking down the street. I live like seven minutes walking to the symphony hall. So I'm either in a plane with Seraph or I'm walking to symphony hall. So it's, it's a great, it really is a great life. And I'm really close with all those brass players in that orchestra. Um, so that is what my life is in a nutshell. Also on top of that, I'm an Alexander Technique teacher. Do you guys know what that is? How many, yeah? Yeah. yeah, I'm an Alexander Technique teacher, and I'm, I really enjoy teaching um, all types of students, not just musicians, but athletes as well. Um, so when I'm not doing, when, when I first joined Seraph, I, I officially was announced in September 2021, and it was during um, a time period right after COVID where music was slowly starting to make a scene again. So performances, live performances are starting to come back, and I lost all confidence during COVID. Um, I didn't know if I could ever play with people again. It was, it was a really rough time. Um, and then I was announced into this group and it was like my saving grace. But I was really nervous. And I was really nervous because I was doing a lot of, well, I wasn't at the time because of COVID, but I was doing a lot of work with Boston Symphony Orchestra. And I was worried that brass quintet playing would take away my orchestral style. I thought I would have to play with a smaller sound or a more nitpicky sound because that was what I've normally had to do in other brass quintets that I've played in in Boston. Um, and I was like, oh man, this might be a mistake, but let's, let's just do it. This is going to be your first real job out of COVID. Um, and I remember like one or two months in, I had a BSO call and they, uh, I remember sitting next to Toby Oft and he, he does this thing that stresses me out sometimes but now I know him, so it doesn't stress me out anymore. He does this. And he just looked at me and he paused for 10 seconds and I was just, and he goes, your playing changed. And I immediately was like, I freaking knew it. I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. I knew he was gonna say that. I was like, I'm like, oh, this. he goes, you're really, you're so detailed with all of your entrances 
all of your releases. You change everything the second it happens. And I'm like, holy shit, I didn't expect that at all. <laughs> I, I was ready for him to be like, you know, you've, you've, you've lost, I, I thought he was going to tell me like, oh, you've lost your, your, you know, this orchestral sound that we like. He goes, and then I was like, oh my gosh, he's, this is, this is a good thing. And the more and more I trusted playing in brass quintet, the better my orchestral playing got. The more and more I trusted how to bring out my solo lines in a brass quintet piece, the more and more I trusted myself to bring solo lines in orchestral playing. And the more and more I trusted the process, the better my practicing gets. What Rachel mentioned is that we have rehearsals the day before, right? We always have a joke that um, we all have chops of steel. Have you ever tried to get ready for an orchestral audition while being on a full tour with a brass quintet? I have, and I'm not gonna lie, I finish like a round of playing. Sometimes me and Christina will play excerpts together. We'll be like, what the heck are we doing? <laughs> It, the adversity training that goes into getting ready for an audition it, and what touring taught me is that I can be incredibly versatile. Brass Quintet teaches you to be incredibly flexible if you're also at the same time, when even when you don't think you have the face to do it, you can practice orchestral excerpts. And that versatility while traveling to an audition getting ready for an audition, or even you're sitting in the warm-up room for an orchestral audition and you're thinking, man, I don't, something doesn't feel right. I don't know how to do this. My mind has shifted to be like, well, it's going to be game time in an hour anyway. So you're either going to stress about it now or you're going to figure it out during the process. And my mind has shifted now since being in brass quintet playing, the show must go on. And that has brought in a lot of great experiences in my auditions so far. Um, I have made it to final rounds that I never thought I would see myself in and meet amazing trombone players that are like starting to recognize me in, in, the, in the community. And um, it wouldn't have happened if I didn't join a brass quintet. So that was, um, yeah, if anyone has any questions about that later, I'd be happy to ask, but I'm not gonna hog the mic anymore. Because I want to talk to this star right here who is now the <laughs> second female tubist to win a full-time job in a symphony orchestra. Well, that's a very nice introduction. Um, hi, I'm Christina Cutts Doherty. Um, I'm the tuba player in Seraph. And uh, yeah, I've, I'm the newest member and have just had the most... Uh, incredible year of my life with this group um, and just like Vicky I'm just so incredibly grateful that I sort of took the leap after I, I went to conservatories I went to the Colburn School and the Curtis Institute for school and while they're amazing places they are very focused on orchestra and um, I was very scared to embark into fr the freelancing scene or uh, being in a brass quintet and I sort of took that leap partially on uh, Vicky's advice and um, and yeah just like her I've had I've just grown so much so I really encourage you to um, to not keep those blinders on and and to uh, sort of experience just all the all the ways that we can use our instruments um, in this field and on that note um, one thing that I really love to talk about this is my small wisdom from a short life so far um, <laughs> but uh, yeah one of the things I've uh, had to learn especially um, being a female tuba player uh, and you know often going into spaces where I'm the only woman in the room um, is just learning to advocate for myself and I think that applies to everyone, especially those of you who are entering school soon, um, just learning to uh, value yourself, value your time and what you have to offer. And uh, if you see an opportunity that you want to put yourself out there uh, in any way that you can to get it, just like Mary was talking about um, sort of manifesting the dream of Seraph Brass that she has done. I mean, she's such an amazing example of a person in our field who has just seen these things that she wanted and just completely manifested that and made that come true all for herself. Um, and yeah, so uh, just one small story, an, an example that, that really changed my mindset with this. Um, when I first uh, entered grad school, 
I wasn't, you know, I wasn't super confident and uh, I had taken a couple orchestral auditions and not done really particularly well in any of them. I hadn't advanced. Um, but I saw there was this private audition happening um, and all of these colleagues of mine, all of these guys who I was friends with who were the same age as me were being invited to this audition and I just... It was really bothering me, and for months I just I just sat there and I was like waiting for my invitation <laughs> because I was like I these, I'm on the same level as some of these people. I've been to conferences with these people and uh, been in, in auditions with them. Um, and finally, about a month before the audition, I worked up the nerve to ask my teacher if he could vouch for me and, and get me into this audition. Um, and it was really scary. I didn't know him that well and didn't know what was going to happen. Um, but luckily, I was able to get into the audition. And that audition, I actually made the super finals in. Um, and so that was a huge turning point for me, uh, just realizing that my voice matters and that when I advocate for something that uh, I really want, Som somehow it just has a way of working out. <laughs> um, I know there's a, a sort of a, a trend going around right now of saying, I'm so lucky everything works out for me. I don't know if anyone on TikTok <laughs> has seen this. Uh, I decided I, I can't just sit here. Um, I need to do something. And I uh, got my CNA license, my Certified Nursing Assistance license. Um, but this started because I was a COVID tester. I would test people in their cars. They would drive up and I would um, give them the thing. They would swab themselves. Um, but that started my love of, um, of just talking to the patients and um, just getting to know people that way. And I, it sparked a passion in me. And so I decided to get my CNA license. And I did that. It was kind of like... Um, uh, being pulled in two different directions at one point. Um, I was like, should I do healthcare? Should I, is the music going to ever come back? And of course it has. And now the, the CNA thing is kind of on the back burner, but I'm still, because I have that license, um, that license has opened up so many doors so that I can just do, um, if, if Serif doesn't tour or whatever, and I don't have any gigs, I can pick up some shifts at hospitals or nursing homes and make a living that way. And um, there's also the balance of practicing along with that. How do you do that? Well, I hate to say it, you just got to wake up earlier and, <laughs> and go to bed later a little bit um, and make sure... Um, that you, like she was saying about mental health, always getting out and being social too on top of that. Um, having oodles of jobs sometimes can be really, really um, mentally, you know, you, you start to struggle. So um, just making sure you have that time for yourself is really important. Um, but yeah, I hate to say it, but yeah, I've had to wake up a lot earlier in order to get that warm up in and uh, making sure that um, just because I am on a shift that day that I'm still buzzing, I'm doing every, I'm sneaking off sometimes. Um, and I've, I've, I've actually found ways to incorporate music into caregiving. Um, they love it. I can just bring my horn um, and play for them and they absolutely adore it. So, you know, I get, I get to do two things at once and it's really, really, yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah. And they're, they're just so grateful to hear music in general, so you, you can not be at your best, <laughs> and they'll still appreciate it. So, um, But yeah, just making sure you have a good routine, too, is important um, in the, in the warm-up and then getting your fundamentals in, making sure you cover everything. I've got um, articulations, trills, long tones, you name it, um, ranges, leaps, um, arpeggios of all kinds. You have to make sure that you do some form of every single kind, <laughs> every single day. So um, just finding the right uh, how quality practice, not quantity, is what I've always been told um, is more important, making sure you, you're getting those high notes in every day so your endurance doesn't suffer. So yeah, waking up early. <laughs> Well, now we'd love to hear from you. We have a mic set up down here to take some questions. Uh, so who will be the first brave soul? <laughs> and it's scary to jump up to get there. Up. <laughs> There's even a spotlight. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh, here we go. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 
for the trombone player, how did you get into Alexander Technique? And oh, kind of get that story. <laughs> yeah. You really want to know this? It comes with a pretty good story. Okay, so uh, I went to Boston Conservatory for my undergrad. And um, I really... God, you know, like when you're sophomore year, you have to take something like ridiculous number of credits. It's like something like 14, 16 credits or something like that. It's a lot. And I just wanted a class that was super easy. I wanted an easy A class. Alexander Technique, done. I could take naps. It's great. And I went into this class, and there's this woman named Debbie Adams, and she teaches the class. And I was like, oh, this lady's like really nice. I really like her. And... I got through the class, and I was like, wow, that was, I didn't believe in the Alexander Technique at all. Don't, don't get it twisted. I thought it was not real. You know, I was like, well, oh, spacey people like this stuff. And so I decided to do it another semester because, again, an easy credit filled up my class schedule, and it was, it was done. And then she goes at the, at the very end, um, she was like, oh, you're really, in, like, you're into this class. I'm like, Yeah. Totally, I'm definitely into Alexander Technique. Uh, I just really liked that she thought that I liked Alexander Technique. <laughs> so then, fast forward, I am about to start my master's at New England Conservatory in 2014, and one month, no, two weeks before I'm start to start, about to start my very first class at NEC, I get a contact from um, this teacher saying, hey, would you be interested in taking the Alexander Technique teacher training course? And I was like, Mal, I want to be a better trombone player. So I told her, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be a teacher, though. I just want to be a better trombone player. That's it. I don't care about anything else. And so I, I made the mistake. I didn't realize that um, I would be double majoring at the time. I realized that after I graduated with my master's. So I went headfirst into a three-year teacher training course of the Alexander Technique which involved something like 12 hours a week of classes on top of my down the street NEC classes and rehearsals. I was never getting any sleep. Um, I had like 8 a.m. classes two times a week and then one class at night for like once a week and then it was, it was a lot. Um, so, and I still, three years of this, of this teacher training course in the first two and a half years, I still didn't believe in this nonsense. And then I had to teach it. I had to teach 160 hours of free Alexander Technique lessons. And all I kept thinking about was, I don't know what the heck I'm doing. I'm like, what have I been doing these past two and a half years? But there were moments in those two years where um, I used to have debilitating back pain. Like I couldn't, there were times where I couldn't pick up the trombone. My husband, who's in the audience tonight, had to one time walk me to class because I couldn't stand up straight. I was paralyzed in bed once. And he was like, I don't know what this Alexander Technique thing is, but I know it's going to help you. And so he got me to my class at 8 a.m. And I was able to leave that day two hours later walking upright, didn't need his help. So there were times in my life in those three years that I realized, oh, this stuff might be real. And then I'd be like, nah, this is crap. So then I'm very stubborn. I'm from New York, if you can't tell by the way I speak. So I... Where I'm now teaching students, and I have, as part of my practicum, I have to teach them six lessons, and then they have to write a review for my teacher to read, to see how I'm teaching the technique to others. And she pulled me aside one day. I'm like, oh boy, here we go. She's going to find out I'm an imposter. And she wrote, <laughs> she told me, um, all of your students, I wanted you to read some of these. And what I read from all of the students, multiple dozens of students that I was teaching, is that they, their lives were completely transformed by how you were teaching the Alexander Technique to them. And I was like, what? Wait, I'm, I'm making somebody's life, their music ability, making that easier for them. And I got jealous. I was like, wait, I'm making other people better, but I refuse to make myself better. And that was the light that I needed to see. So then, I remember that night, I started practicing Alexander Technique on myself in the practice room and how I would, could be my own teacher. And that day moving forward, um, I became really confident in how I was teaching the technique. And that was very a transformative thing in my life um, because every day, I do not believe the Alexander Technique works, but skeptics make the best teachers because we prove ourselves wrong every single day. 
And um, I have a studio in Boston. I teach a multi multitude of different uh, musicians, anywhere from flute. Sometimes I've taught flute lessons. I teach brass players a lot, M mainly brass players, because when I go to Boston, it's, you know, all the BSO brass players are like, oh, you got to go study with Vicky. You got to go study with Vicky. And I also work down the street from BSO, and I live there. So that is how I got into Alexander Technique. It was purely just for the sake of having an easy A in a class in undergrad. And then it, um, I realized an important lesson is that the only way to get better at your instrument is understanding yourself more. And not just mentally, physically, it's the whole aspect of you. And if you're not willing to work with yourself, how is somebody else going to change you? So that is, so, do we have any other questions? We it's quintet, I've been playing a quintet the past three years more than ever before. And I don't want to get you in trouble, but um, <laughs> how do you, you know, how do you tackle um, tuning between when you have a line with the tuba, maybe in octaves, and that seems to be more important, or when you're in octaves with the first trumpet, and that seems to be more important, or when you're playing with an organ and the organ D is out of tune, and you know you can like hit perfectly with that D, but maybe they cannot as easily. Like, like you never trust an organ, so that's that's your first, that's your response okay. right there. So, <laughs> thank you. So uh, we actually, we did a recital in upstate New York in April, and the organ was literally so flat, you, like you couldn't tune your instrument to it. And it was, that was a rough, what, do you remember that show? That was so rough. We were kind of just all looking at each other like, this is just deadpan, just like we didn't know what to do about it either. So the question is, wide eyes, just hope for the best. Um, but what I, what I would normally do in that situation is I'd hit it and immediately back away. Like just, I, I'm just gonna be the accent and then I'm just gonna let the organ do whatever it is. So if it's a half step lower, I'm just gonna be like, accent, back off. Just pretend to look like I'm playing at that point. But when it comes to brass quintet um, balancing, and this is this can be applied for orchestral playing as well or you know playing in a section, um, what I always do is that, I, I like to think of the trombone voice, if you're not, a solo line, you are connecting, you're a glue to something else. And so a lot of the time, uh, me and Christina, we share a lot of stuff in the brass quintet. We share a lot of sometimes octave stuff or interval stuff, but it's the same, uh, same melody. And if she's going into a, a register that is really low for her, what I'm doing is I'm not competing with her. I'm bringing the front to the note and bring that that little bit of clarity in a register that might be a little bit more hard for her to get some like some pings out um, but I'm not sustaining it so I'm relying on her power in in those meteor registers to be to give that comfort to give that cushion for the upper voices so we're not both blasting to play loud we're both being sensitive to each other and if she goes into the register that I'm more comfortable with she's now tuning to me. So it's a constant, um, you have to keep your ears constantly open and this is the same for orchestral playing. Um, and then when I have to, there's um, in the Chimera that we're doing, um, that we're playing tomorrow night, uh, there's a lot of voices where I share with Rachel, Rachel and Mary, and now I have to change my color, my tone, so it's a little bit more lighter. Um, and by changing color and changing shape, that also that's, that's also part of the intonation game. So um, in, in those instances, I'm like, okay, those are the lead voices, but I'm supporting the lead voice. I have the same exact melody, but I don't want to stick out and compete with the main melody. Um, now, Mary often has to tell me to take it down. <laughs> I get really excited. <laughs> me and Christina both get very excited. So that tends to be the the... There's always somebody in the ensemble, right? We're, we're those somebodies. <laughs> um, but that's how I approach intonation, and I'm pretty sure the girls would all agree. It's a, it's a constant game of keeping your ears open and being sensitive, and then knowing when those voices come out, how, you know, how does everybody retune and readjust sound concepts to make that voice more, more heard? So if anyone else wants to jump in on that too, that's, that'd be cool. I'll just say, um don't be the stubborn one. Be the one that moves. <laughs> you know, especially if you don't play the tuba. <laughs> We're the only ones who are allowed to be stubborn. <laughs> any, any other questions? <laughs> well, it is very nice to meet all of you and meet you in person and see how different all of you are. 
And by the way you speak, it sounds like every tour is like a magical place. You guys go have fun and every day you just wake up, have drinks together, do these lovely things and then you come home. Talk about the bad things, the hard things and the challenges things and how you solve them and what you do to solve them. So the tour life is not a glamorous life. We do it because, I do it because I love playing music on stage and I love traveling to new places and meeting new people. But there's a lot of uh, traumatic things that can, that can happen on the tour. I know Hits is out there in the audience. He knows very well, you know, that I, I definitely will never have the same stress Christina has when her tuba <laughs> comes out onto the luggage uh, conveyor belt. <laughs> um, or TSA looking through my trumpet and denting my brand new G trumpet. Uh, so that's, there, there are layers of that. And also, you know, I, what we've experienced since COVID has been, you know, like this year we've, you know, we lost a bunch of tours. Some of them came back and we had some strange routing this year and, um, but we need to make a living. So we have to build these tours together. And what we've really noticed is that there's been like much more extreme weather the past year than, than any other year before. I mean, I've been since day one, I've been in the group and this is what I've noticed this year's like probably the most chaotic in that sense. There's less airline uh, workers, and so there's a lot more, there's so many more problem, random problems with planes and random cancellations mixed in with extreme weather. It's, it's been very chaotic. And so, you know, next year we have to tweak that and make sure it's not as chaotic because we just can't trust the airlines to be 100% at all, probably 50%. So it's, that, that changes things. And, uh, but even before COVID, you know, when we're on the road touring and we're driving across the country, there can be driving tours or flying tours. It really just depends on what the managers book, what I book, and uh, we piece things together like that. But yeah, we have to share a car. We're basically, you know, we're the size of a family. Um, and we, ha we, we are very close knit. So not only are we work colleagues, but we're also just in a very small confined space for a long time. <laughs> and so, you know, we have to be able to like overcome conflict. And one thing that I find that's, that's, that helps a lot is uh, having a sense of humor and being flexible. We're all gonna be grumpy. We're all gonna have things that happen. And I think like, when we joke about it is when I get my best tour stories and when we can just have a good laugh about it. Um, those are my, my personal favorite moments of tours. Like if they were just like fly in and fly out, I don't think we would have these like in, these funny stories that happen or that stories that are funny later, whatever you want to call it. Um, but then our job is to share music on stage. The audience doesn't care that we were experiencing this and that or if her face feels bad like nobody cares we have to go on stage we can share a little bit but you know we're sharing music with the audience and I feel like if I'm in the worst pain or having a bad day when I get on stage and I see an audience full of people for that hour hour and a half or two hours I will always forget my pain I will always forget everything else and I just feel the energy from the audience and sharing music and um and that's what really, I, for, for me, that's what holds the tours together and what, what makes all of the stuff around it worthwhile is just sharing music with the audience and that connection with the audience is just such a powerful, powerful experience of how music can just transcend yourself. Even if you're feeling the worst, it can just bring, you can just go on stage and the music uplifts yourself and the audience. Hey, so uh, first of all, uh, again, I think I speak for most people when I say uh, thank you guys for being here. Uh, this, is, this has been life-changing. Um, my question is that uh, it sort of goes on to this sort of like dealing with the less gr glamorous things. So uh, when you rehearse, when you rehearse, how do you deal with disagreements as far as uh, repertoire you're playing or the way that you're playing a piece or the way that you're interpreting something? Uh, yeah. Sure. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think that, as Mary said, uh, we're kind of a little family, and so uh, everything that we do I, is, is founded in deep respect for one another, um, and I think that's required for uh, making music or doing work with anyone. Uh, you just have to have that 
respect for everyone's uh, opinions and, and their voices. So, I mean, often if someone has a new idea that maybe everyone's not super excited about at first, we always try it out. You know, that's the rule. You always try it out. Um, you always give it that space to be heard, and then we, we make group de decisions off of that. Um, and yeah, I mean, as, as uh, Rachel was saying about uh, the, the repertoire we pick, um, it's all very collaborative, and uh, we, we work on all the programs together and make sure that it's something that feels really true to everyone. Um, we also each have a solo feature, so we get to sort of have that piece be like our special piece, um, which I really love. Um, and yeah, I think, I think, yeah, it just goes, it just goes down, it boils down to respect for one another and um, you really can't make good music with someone if you are looking down on them or uh, if you let a personal problem with them sort of enter that space. It's sort of, we have to leave our egos at the door and um, just make the music as great as it can possibly sound, so. I think that's great advice. I remember um, when I first started Serif, uh, a friend of mine, Jeff Luke, who used to play in Atlantic Brass Quintet, that was his biggest advice to me in the group was, before rehearsal, you have to leave the ego at the door and uh, because if you, you know, you, you, we all want the same highest level musical product. So that's helped us work pretty efficiently together, especially when we meet the day before, Rachel was saying, we meet the day before, we don't have a lot of time. So, we and, and the five of us, I, I think I can speak this, uh, we like to now finish rehearsal as fast as possible. <laughs> so efficiency is key so we can go eat dinner and go to sleep. We're gonna play tomorrow evening. We had a, a pretty heavy recording session this morning. Hi, um, so I was wondering how you go about building connections and relationships in the music world, whether it's as a group or in your individual careers. I'll say something shortly. Um, for me, it's been social media as a soloist and for the group. I started my solo career a bit later than other soloists in my late 20s, so I was aged out of competitions for the most part, and but I wanted to be seen as a soloist as I was really wanting to do more concertos and recitals. And so I just started sharing videos on YouTube and then Instagram and Facebook started growing and I just want people to hear me. So I share a lot and that resulted in more inquiries and uh, more engagements. And so each year has built on that. So that's just been a huge game changer for myself and for Sarah Brass. Um, I definitely, you know, if you're in school right now, that's your best first first starting point and in, 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 in regards to networking and building relationships but uh, attending conferences even if you're still a student I think is really beneficial um, for me the International Trumpet Guild uh, International Women's Brass Conference I've met many great colleagues friends collaborators um, I even recently went to the International Trombone Festival in Conway Arkansas last summer which was, I was blown away by the way, trombonists can really play. <laughs> um, but I, I think uh, when you go to these conferences or anywhere you go, uh, you know, be a good person. Someone that someone wants to get to know and maybe collaborate with. You know, um, everyone, you, you have to, f I've noticed in my, for me, that people like confidence, but not too much confidence. You know, you don't want to be too self-promoting. At the same time, don't be too meek to ask or to introduce yourself. Uh, when people introduce themselves to me, I always think, oh, you know, I'd love to, you know, what are you, what are you about? And, you know, and, and I just love building relationships that way. And I do that to this day. You know, I have some people that I still fangirl with and, and uh, I'm very excited, particularly the Inter International Women's Brass Conference is a place that I, I feel like I really make a lot of great connections. So, um, but that's just my little two cents on that. Do you want to say something? I would just say um, going out to as many live music events as you can. Just everything, anything and everything, because you never know. I've played in um, cover bands and done all sorts of um, 
things outside of the classical realm. Um, and it's just through meeting people um, outside of the classical realm. <laughs> uh, going to those live music sets of jazz or rock music. Um, I played in a rock opera once because of that. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. <laughs> This is my strongest point. Don't brown nose. I'm serious. Um, I, you know, I think what made me very active and how I got active in the freelance scene quickly was I did it with like stealth mode. I just, you show up and you play well. You're 100% ready every single time you pick. If you're only playing a whole note, make sure that's the best whole note you're going to play. Because someone's hearing it. Someone, some, there's always someone out there listening. You don't need to go up and say hi to somebody at a gig. You don't need to always go and, and introduce. If you're, if you're an amazing player and they really liked what you did, they'll find you. They'll, they'll figure out who you are. So my biggest key is, and this is, again, this is how I think I got into the freelance scene so quickly after I did my under, after my master's is, I practiced really hard, so when that gig did come, my first union gig, or my first pops call, or my first BSO call, there was no doubt in my mind that I knew every single measure. I knew exactly how many measures I was gonna count. I knew exactly where that chord was gonna lie for me in that chord structure. So be 100% ready, don't brown nose, and let your playing speak for itself. And that is that is really how you make awesome connections. So that's that's my two cents. I think we had, we had another question. <laughs> I really had two questions. First would be for the trombone player. Um, do you uh, change your equipment between orchestral and uh, and quintet? And the second would be because I'm I've started my own quintet, and music selection is is a tough thing. You have to change your your repertoire depending on what uh, on on your the venue that you're playing the audience that you're playing to so how do you how do you select between the classical and things that are more in the pop style or even you know bending toward extreme pop styles uh, <laughs> how far down that rabbit hole do you go so the question is if i change my orchestral setup to brass quintet setup i do not I play on the same setup, same mouthpiece, same everything. So that's it. <laughs> so as far as repertoire, you know, Serif Brass has built our sta some of our fa cl classical standards that we've played since the first year, like the prelude to the Holberg Suite. We've just kept it. Um, audiences know that really well, and I think it's really smart not to completely change programs every single year, but to... Um, integrate new pieces in a way because when you're when you're what we what I've learned with touring is that like when you play a piece again and again and I've learned this as a soloist too you build muscle memory in your face and so um being the leader of the group I think it's very smart to keep some of that same rep through the years because you know I could wake up in the middle of the night and play Holberg um or the Hungarian Rhapsody or now we've memorized De Lorenzo's Go and uh, and so it's really cool to have those those kind of pieces that are audience favorites, but they're also so ingrained with us that we just know them like the back of our hand. And so we've had those pieces follow us around a bit. But then we get tired of some, like we've had a few sets of pieces where we're like, we're done with those. We're gonna shelf them for a while, maybe forever. Um, and then we bring new stuff to the table and we like to make sure we incorporate new commissions uh, or pieces that we've joined consortiums for into that mix. Uh, we usually like, right now we're doing some research for next season. We've been touring with uh, Kevin Day's Fantasia Three, which is a really super fun brass quintet. And so now we're looking for a piece to uh, replace that with, but we're probably gonna keep his second movement in the touring next year because it's one of our favorite pieces to play. And so right now we're, we're really working on that. And then, uh, as far as being jazzy or more popular, we don't do anything extreme popular, but sometimes we have been asked by a presenter, can you 
share us a program that has more pops tune, more pop tunes on it or more Broadway or this and that. And then we'll hand make the program before we sign that contract to make sure we have, we'll have to build in some more rehearsal time for that or make sure it's in our summer rehearsal uh, plan. But for the year, we have the same program that we tour with. Either the presenter will ask for with intermission or without. And we like to keep that program the same through the year because there's a lot of, uh, you know, just meeting the day before, brushing up, and then performing. And then you'll probably, you probably notice from social media and from our website that we do have a guest ar artist roster. And I think that's something very unique and special about Serif. Our core members, we have six. Uh, the other trumpeter, Jean, uh, just had a baby, so she'll be rejoining us in the spring on our Illinois tour. And uh, the core do 80% of the concerts or anything that's more um, a high-end presenter. I mean, we love all the presenters, but we, you know, we do all have other things in our careers. And I don't want myself or the other musicians to feel limited, like we have to play every Serif gig and turn down a concerto or a, a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity or an audition. And so the guest roster list has helped us, helped us all be able to stay in the group in a really, really healthy way. And plus our guest artist list is is incredible we've those ladies know the book just as well as we do and so we have a lot of fun when we bring in like a a person that's one of they become part of of the Sarah family which is super fun so yeah to answer long story short if we get asked to pops program it's usually when we're booking concerts now for next season and i'll look at the calendar and be like do we have the rehearsal time to be able to make a program that fits this series needs and the answer might be no sometimes or it might be like sure we can add another day and negotiate that because we can't play a bunch of different programs th throughout the year because of the time constraints i think we have time for one more question Well, if not, it's been such a pleasure to uh, share some of our stories with you all. Uh, please follow us on Instagram, Serif Brass, and also Facebook and our website. And uh, we do travel through this area here and there and around Virginia. I forgot to mention that I'm based in Winchester, Virginia, where I teach at Shenandoah Conservatory. Serif will be there doing a residency next November. Uh, so keep in touch on our site, and we often do come through Virginia, so we hope to see you all in the future. Thank you so much, and tomorrow night.